Welcome to this week's episode of the Cyberwork with InfoSec podcast. Each week I sit down with a different industry thought leader and we discuss the latest cybersecurity trends, how those trends are affecting the work of InfoSec professionals, while offering tips for those trying to break in or move up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Scott Madsen is the CEO at Singo Solutions, a provider of cybersecurity, MDR, and IT consulting based in the southwestern United States. Uh, now, Scott has been a, a guest on the InfoSec webinar uh, concerning cybersecurity skills gap, which is a regular topic on this podcast. So we're going to talk a little bit about the skills gap today, as well as some of the uh, interesting things going on over at Singo. Uh, Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, so first of all, tell me a bit about your background. When did you first get involved in computers and, and security? And, and what, what, were these always interesting to you, or did you sort of come to it later in life? Always had an interest in it. Um, I came to. I ended up coming into it a little bit later in life. My partners are I and I uh, all come from kind of varying backgrounds. One of them's from tech. One of them's from finance. I'm from hmm. kind of more of an inventory management, logistical uh, consulting background. Um, but really, when we kind of came together, um, our love of process, our love of uh, trying to figure out how to make things more efficient, um, we kind of caused us to to end up launching Singo. Mm -hmm. um, since then, we uh, we started with just doing uh, full-fledged web, de web development and then managed IT, and we ended up kind of working with a lot of companies that need or require uh, regulatory compliance, and so it's kind of been a very interesting thing for us. We, With our backgrounds, we kind of get that quite a bit of, I had to work with the FDA quite a bit, and with uh, uh, you know individual Oregon qualifiers, or not Oregon, sorry, the um, individual uh uh, organic qualifiers in the, in the food industry and um, mm -hmm. then work with banking. And so we ended up taking on clients that had a really heavy compliance base and we were looking for cybersecurity professionals and companies that could, we could refer them to or help uh, kind of broaden out our base of offering and just never found anybody that would be a good fit that could meet and deal with their compliance. Cause they, we, we ended up having to speak directly with state regulators and, and, uh, Never, never really found a good fit, so we ended up just doing it ourselves. And so most of our, our base for, for our uh, clients are all dealing, all deal with industries that relate to some element of compliance. So we work with their internal compliance, we work okay. with, uh, again, state, federal, and, uh, and yeah, and so that's kind of where our specialty ended up residing. Okay, uh, so you're pri primarily involved in compliance, it sounds like, that's your, that's your primary? Yep, well, primary, primary is cybersecurity, but again, okay. Most compliance has a really specific um, requirement for cyber that sure. I yeah. a lot of cybersecurity companies really understand how to deal with, um, but we've worked with those guys for years, so it's something that's, that uh, kind of has helped us find our niche in the market. Are there any particular sort of aspects of cybersecurity and compliance that you, you know, sort of got so good at that you're sort of the, you know, the brand leader or, you know, like, like what are some of the more unusual sort of cybersecurity requests that people have needed to deal with in order to achieve compliance? In their yeah, well, a lot of it, we, what we'll do is we'll end up getting uh, uh, engaged by companies who are in an audit or have been, you know, have had a bad audit and need to be do some, some work on their internal processes. Hmm. Uh, and then they get referred to us just through our current customer base. Um, and then we go in and, and basically just evaluate where they are. Uh, a big part of what we do, I mean, I, I would say that probably our specialty is financial institutions. Um, we also work with the FDA uh, for, for both pharmaceutical and, you know, healthcare providers. Um, I think that you guys have done quite a bit of work and done great work on, on notifying the public about the CCPA. Yes. Um, I think once regulation ends up getting, getting put into law, it's very hard to back that off. Um, and yeah. most things are going to end up following and trending that way. So you're talking about instead of the people that we deal with being legal firms and accounting firms and these financial institutions, things like that, you're talking about people who own bowling alleys, people who own right. you know, diners and things yep. that never had to deal with anything like this that are going to all of a sudden be randomly audited and, and be uh, fined for noncompliance. And so it really, I think right now, especially as a cybersecurity provider, uh, you know, the, the gauntlet's kind of been thrown down for us to say, how are we going to help our clients uh, navigate the new framework that we're, we're entering into um, and and how can we better train our staff you know as a cybersecurity focus how can we better or train our staff to uh, have kind of a dual purpose of compliance and cybersecurity hmm. is that sort of a niche that you've you found for yourself uh, working with the sort of uh, mom and pop businesses or the small organizations like that or is that just sort of part of it it's it's just part of it I mean yeah. uh, you know, for us, and, and it's it's been a good thing. I mean, usually you kind of have to swim upstream a little bit with when you're starting a business. But for us, it's it's kind of an area where we all have 
uh, personal proficiency. And so coming together and, and, uh, and ending up with the client base that we have, um, it's something that's been very natural. And since really most of the, and like the CCPA, it's the California uh, Consumer Privacy Act, yep. they, most of it's dealing with how you deal with data. That's something we're doing anyway. Um, okay. And then how you're protecting people's data, which again is something we're doing anyway. And so kind of helping to create solutions that are going to be a lot more effective and cost effective for, for smaller businesses has been something that we've, we've really enjoyed over the past couple of years, putting those programs together has been, has been really effective for us. So. Cool. Uh, so yeah, going back to something you said before, you, you mentioned that, you know, your you and your colleagues, you know, come from kind of divergent backgrounds and you're not strictly tech and cyber people. And I think this is something we, we come to on our program a lot because a lot of our listeners are people who might not be involved with cybersecurity at all, but want to get into it and feel, well, I can't necessarily because I've been in finance for 20 years or I've been doing government work or whatever. So, uh, sir, can you talk a bit about that? What, what makes, uh, you know, the sort of diversity of, of backgrounds uh, so important at Signal? Well, I think, you know, we're at a really interesting moment here with, this, with the, the skills gap, with trying to entice people into to doing what we want to do or what we're doing for a living and, and, and need them for. Um, and I think that, IT is a fantastic field to get into. I mean, it's, it's about as deep and as broad as you can get as far as uh, skill sets within the industry, as far as requirements for um, educational ad or education and, ad and adaptation uh, for an individual basis and also for a company basis. Um, and I think that anyone wanting to make the switch, I think it's a great thing. I, I don't think that there's going to be um, – that you're going to regret going the route that you did. We have actually, I would say that if you lined up all of our employees, the most common background is in finance. Almost, okay. We have a probably 30 to 40% of our staff used to work as, as uh, financial advisors or brokers. They used to work for banks as lending, as lenders. Um, and they kind of started to see a little bit of the threat uh, that, was, that was kind of coming up in their day to day and the way the banks were starting to kind of um, they're kind of slow moving, but the way that they start to surround themselves and say, okay, we need to start to have the cybersecurity focus. They saw it as a way to separate themselves out from, you know, every other FA or, you know, everybody else in their industry and to, to pick up a unique skill set and move into it. So I think, and those, a lot of those are some of our more effective ones that have come over later in life. Um, they they feel real passion, real drive about what they're doing. And, uh, and I, I think that if we're talking about making a switch and, and, and how to close the skills gap, it's 100% about, about passion and interest. Okay. I think um, another thing, and I don't mean to just go on if you want to move through the questions. Oh, no, no, not at all. I tend to, I tend to speak to talk a lot. So. Sure, that's fine. <laughs> I only have so many questions, so feel free to <laughs> answer them all in detail. There you go. Um, but I think that something that's kind of unique in our industry right now is we're seeing a lot of people being able to move into it. And, and uh, you know, the, the draw is that people are saying, you know, move into text, you'll make a hundred grand a year, you'll make six figures and it'll be really easy. And the reality is, no, you won't. It's right. not. Tech is, is just like any other skill. And I think that people underestimate that. And I think when we talk about a skills gap, that's why we're not talking about a, a, a potential worker gap. We're talking about just the skill that it takes to do what we do. And I think that we underestimate that as an industry, we've underestimated and we've rewarded bad behavior in hiring people who are not capable of doing the job at a high rate um, just because we need somebody in the seat. And I think that it's done, it's done quite a bit of damage to people's expectations about what they can do and what they think that they're worth. Um, and I think that we've kind of gone away from the model of, you know, apprentice uh, journeyman master where people should come in and, and really be absorbing um, data. They should be absorbing how to learn about how to do these processes. And then as they adapt to it, then they can actually, you know, become more valuable to the company because they can act on those adaptations. And then as they become, uh, you know, as they get 10, 15 years in, they, they're basically masters. They can, they can uh, dictate how things go. They can recognize um, threats and trends coming down through the market. Um, you know, a lot of our analysts have, got, have come up through and they've ended up uh, just from years and years of experience of walking, watching how the market moves and the way these threats develop, they can, they can usually forecast with, with a fair amount of certainty uh, what we're going to be dealing with. But I think that in order to, to close that skills gap, you know, China doesn't have a skills gap in this area. And I think it's because we take the low paying jobs and learn it and come up through it and then, um, you know, and end up building a career long term in it. But again, I think we've taken uh, in, in the U.S., I think we've taken a short term approach to just getting people into the system 
paying them a large sum of money and not really doing our yeah. jobs, making sure that they have the confidence that they should. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I think one of the problems, like you, you said it specifically, is that a lot of places will say, well, just put someone in there. We don't have time to yeah. find the right person. So where, where does the time come from exactly? What do we, what do we do in the meantime? Like is, because you know, you, what you're saying is there, there needs to be a, a large sort of farm team of entry level cybersecurity jobs out there that people can learn through. And that sounds like that, that fundamentally requires sort of restructuring large swaths of the, you know, the workforce. So what, what, what do we do about that? Well, I think that the interesting thing is it's not really the workforce's problem. It's our problem as cybersecurity companies to figure out, help those people become the best that that we can, you know, that that we can have. So companies, you know, something that that we've done here at Singo is we've tried really hard to take people where they are. So when we interview, we bring people in, you can't, you can teach anybody, uh, you know, any skill out there, but you can't teach them a work ethic. They've Mm -hmm. got to come in with that. And if they really want to learn then great, we'll pay them. We, we have jobs that we won't let them touch, you know, the, the, the high voltage stuff, but they can right. serve around and, and, and learning those skills. And, you know, we can pay them a, a, a reasonable sum for doing so. But it really comes down to their commitment to making that change in their career and in, in getting on the right path and then staying on it. And so I think that the, the burden 100% is not on uh, the people who want to come over, except for that they need to have passion, they need to have that drive. It's 100% on us. If we, if Singo hopes to have a long-term uh, workforce that we can draw from and that we can that we can can pull from. We have to have the internal development here to be able to take people from whatever skill set and wherever they are in their learning uh, curve and develop them through to where we have you know if if they want to go all the way to the top and they want to really be in management or they want to be taking on uh, a lot of responsibility. Then heck yeah, we would we pay a very very competitive and fair wage. Um, and we would love to do that. But again, it comes down to where their latent ability is um, and, and what, their, what their drive is, is kind of bringing you to. Okay, so, sorry. So along with, with, work, with work ethic, which obviously is, is crucial, um, mm-hmm. and you mentioned, you know, 30, 40% of your uh, workforce is formerly in finance. Like what are some of the other uh, soft skills or skill sets that people in finance or other industries have that you think are crucial to a cybersecurity career apart from, you know, coding right. and, and networking and so forth. Sure. Sure. Well, I think any industry, and I think it's, you know, when you, when you pull people from professional services, they, uh, there, there's already a cause and effect. that's very natural. It's kind of encoded into them when they come over because of their touching, you know, whether it's they're coming from legal or accounting or from, uh, um, from finance, which are usually the three best to hire from. They're used to working within a framework where if you do the wrong thing, there's not just, oh man, I messed that up, but there could be jail time. There could be, uh, you know, you have a very rigid set of rules. And I think that especially moving into cybersecurity, it is extremely rigid and the the small things are the ones that matter. You know, most of the breaches that we end up, uh, that our clients end up experiencing aren't from um, a lack of of the high-end coverage. It's from a small mistake an employee makes. And so, you know, you really have to find people who have that sense of, of these, are, these are the rigid areas that we have to observe in order to have success here. And if you can get them in and get them trained, then, you know, most people, it's, it's, it's not rocket science. It's just it's not. We have good enough high-end tools to make sure that the really, like I say, the high-voltage stuff is, is usually covered. We need people who are willing to learn how to uh, train, um, you know, the employees of our clients. We need to learn. We need to have people who have those soft skills to interact and to be patient with people who aren't technical professionals. Um, there, like I say, there's so many areas of this job that that you can bring people in and move them through up up until they're, you know, like I say, like they're doing if they're doing an analyst job or if they're, you know, a cybersecurity team lead or something like that. Um, there's so many jobs in between that our companies like us just have to do a much better job of finding, of being willing to train and employees have to be willing to stick with the company, even if they're getting better offers from somebody else. Hmm. Okay. So there's, there needs to be a sort of loyalty with the understanding that, you know, the company is going to sort of be your, be your, you know, your, you, know, you said your journeyman or your, your tradesman that you're learning from. Right, exactly. Well, I think if companies have that well developed, and a lot of companies don't, so I understand why people kind of flip, especially in our industry, from one company to the next. A lot of companies haven't done an effective job of creating internal growth mechanisms to help recognize good talent, recognize people who are who are wanting to to adapt and to to progress. Um, but I think that if if you are in a company that's like that, you should stick it through. You should be there through until you feel like. You've, you've gained the knowledge base that you've been, uh, you know, you've learned as, as much 
of, and you become proficient as, as well as you can with the uh, people around you. And then if you want to move, then great. Now you're a high value uh, uh, acquisition for somebody. But it, I think that again, in our industry, the difficult thing is people come into it expecting a, a vast improvement over their previous life, which right. takes a little bit of time. You just, you can get there, but you've got to take the time. And I think, that's the number one area where our skills gap is, is kind of broadening now is because people are making that jump. They're learning basic skills. They're trying to leverage those skills into better high paying jobs. They're not lasting in the job very, very long. And then they end up moving from job to job to job. And it's just never a long-term situation. I have a, a bunch of my friends are mechanical engineers. I was speaking with one of them a while ago about turnover in, in IT just because it's something we're all dealing with. I mean, the labor market is crazy right now. Yeah. And he was talking about um, as a as a um, mechanical engineer, if you're not with a company for ten years, it shows that you're you're too like flippant, like you're yeah, you're, right, uh, okay. And that's crazy to me. So imagine like you've yeah. got to be with somebody for ten years before you have the credibility with other employers. I, yeah. I there's some there's some smart behind that. So yeah, no, I I used to work in publishing, and I worked with people who you know had been there for 30 years and that was pretty common and then you go into the tech sector and you know you get introduced to the guy who's been here for three years and they're like he's our vet you know yeah that's exactly it it's it's incredible and and what a what what we lose as as you know newer people coming into the industry is you lose the knowledge base that that 30-year veteran can give you yes oh yeah and and so, and companies like us we would pay quite a bit to have a 30-year veteran and i think mm -hmm. most of would, but again People have to, and I think again, it, the burden isn't necessarily on the people in the industry. It's on it's on the the, the job providers. We have to yeah. give people a, a reason to stay and, and to for them to understand that mechanism. And if we get a thirty year veteran in here to understand, you get to teach the next generation of cyber professionals. You get to, you know, be more involved in the day to day ops of the business, the trajectory of where we're going, of how we're identifying new products and and all that. Um, then I think I think we'll have a better. Uh, we'll be doing a lot more service to people in, in the skills gaps, close that to keep people in the positions, to keep them in the jobs as they're expanding and, and to have a perceived benefit for, for more long-term commitment. Well, you say, you know, specifically that you would, you would welcome a 30 year veteran, you know, and, and pay them a commensurate salary. But I, I think one of the problems is a lot of places don't see it that way. I think there's a lot of them are looking at, you know, their budget line and saying, you know, why get this 30 year veteran when I can get, you know, three people who have been around for less than five years for the same price. Totally. Um, so how do we change that sort of perception across the field? Well, I think there's always going to be kind of the lower end providers. I mean, managed IT uh, companies are usually, you know, you, you get kind of the bottom end where they're just charging, you know, 20 bucks a desk to make sure your printer's working. Usually when you send in the ticket, they're 45 days out. I mean, you're always going to have that really low line um, provider all the way up to the really expensive providers. We're probably one of the more expensive providers, but it's because you get a response within 48 hours. You have five people who are, who are assigned to your account that have been veterans here. You're not going to have turnover. You get to know these people. They get to know your company, the way that your data flows. They do, uh, you know, yearly um, uh, follow-ups with you to make sure everything's going the right way. We keep you with the best providers if we aren't currently doing or providing the software. Um, and so I think you're going to have, no matter what, you're going to have bottom, lower end guys and higher end guys, how every market is. But I think that if you're a higher end provider, then by nature, we have to, we have to invest in the people who have long-term goals because we need that, we need that vision. We need that vision to number one, to be in the company, but then to kind of transmit down through the ranks to say, we are forward looking people. And if you want to, to better yourself or better your position and your skill set, then be forward looking with us because we need you. And I think if you don't have, and if you're not willing as a company to invest in high skill, then you, you can't, you can't charge a high rate and you're going to be obsolete eventually because the, the, the life cycle of tech is insane. I mean, you know, three, three to five years, you're, you're, you've either completely remodeled and redesigned your business plan yep. and become twice as effective or you're out of business. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that we talk about on here, especially when we're talking to people about the skills gap is, is the sort of um, job posting gap, which is to say a lot of HR people will uh, put, they're basically sort of trolling for trolling for unicorn candidates. They, they want someone that has, you know, 10 years of experience and a certification is only five years old. They want people with a master's degree when they're only going to be doing code analysis and things like that. And, you know, you're, you're breaking it down even further to say, not just we want the right skills for the right job, but we don't even care if you necessarily have their technical skills as much as you have the soft skills and, and sort of the work ethic in the background. So 
like walk me through what your sort of ideal job posting would be looking for this type of, of can candidate. What, what would you put on there in terms of uh, the skills, the background? How do you sort of convey that even if you don't have all of the things in the list, we still want to hear from you? Mm -hmm. For and it depends on the job that we're that we're posting for. Usually, when we have you know really you know kind of entry level jobs, we have a lot more of them because we work them kind of like apprentices. They spend a lot of hours. They do a lot of uh, you know broad things to try to pick up on as many skills as they can. If we're looking for somebody who's going to be running or and leading those apprentices, those basically the style of apprentices, um, then we obviously need a little bit more experience for something like that. Um, but we need less of them because we we can we can kind of distribute a lot of the of, of the you know. The basic work like my printers down or my this or that we can those are skills you can teach rather quickly it's when you get up into the, the heavy cybersecurity side that you really have to look for specifically skilled people i think one of the big mistakes that we make as an industry though is we look for college graduates i think that uh it's it's something that's nice to have certainly nice to have but again i think that if you if you took a, sam a random sampling of all of the best hackers in the world i would wonder if any of them are college graduates i mean okay. i would, there's you totally negate the latent ability ability and talent of somebody if you say you know if, if you can sit in a classroom for four years versus have you been eat breathing and sleeping this since you're seven or eight mm -hmm. and, you know some of some of our best employees have been younger guys they've been you know 18 to 25 and they've just they didn't go to college but they they do this 24 7 they never stop doing it a lot of the guys who actually pursue and they will pursue like an ethical hacking uh, certificate um, a lot of them are just people who have that natural latent ability to really just pound through code to, to, to you know, be able to forecast a lot of what's happening with the market as far as cybersecurity goes um, and, and, and to identify trends early. You know, a lot of them are just the guys who, you know, if you, if you find a gamer, if you find somebody who loves something, they do it all day, every day. And those are the people that we really look for. And those are the people you know that you can advance really quickly. I think that if there are people who are just looking for a job, we need those two. I mean, at the end we need those to if, if you just do it because uh, uh, you know it's it's a way to pay the bills I get that um, but there's always that uh, that glass ceiling because you're not excelling as much as you would if you if you felt passion and number one people getting into tech in a robotic kind of uh, um, you know disjointed way where they they're they're not incredibly interested but it's something that they can make a good living at I would say don't do it I would okay. rather have you even enter the industry than to, to come in and, and, you know, cause more headache and more problems with hiring someone who you believe is, is capable and competent, then washing out and burning out quickly and then having to go through the process all over again. I don't think they'll be happy and it certainly doesn't make us happy. So. Okay. So how do you square that with, you were saying on one hand, you want, you want these sort of people who have been eating and breathing and living this their entire life. But then the other hand, you have these people who have transferred in from other industries and who are a little older. So how do you, are you, are you specifically looking for those or is that just a byproduct? Like how do you sort of let other types of candidates with other types of skills know that even though they haven't been eating, breathing, sleeping this since they were seven, that they might also have a position in your company? Sure. Well, so we have one employee who is, came over to, uh, they were, she was in banking and uh, uh, just kind of was going with the flow, going through the motions of banking. She ended up coming over and getting into, into tech. And the fire that kind of it lit in her was impressive. I mean, she's she's done a lot of really good work for us and really rose in through the ranks, not because she was she figured that out at a young age, but because when she came over, she realized that it's a passion. And when you're passionate about something, you develop as a person at a totally different rate than any than, than say, you know, the next person. And so I think that uh, it, it doesn't really matter what, what your history is or where you come from. What matters is you're teachable and that you're willing to actually do the groundwork. You're not expecting to get rich right out of the gate. I, I think that it is an industry that is going to continue to grow. I don't think that there's any sign of it slowing down. I think that the, the more regulation that comes in, the more companies actually need uh, companies like Singo or, or you know other companies that do cybersecurity. Um, so I think there's plenty of growth for everybody. And I think there's plenty of money to be made, but I think everybody needs to just slow down, get your ground game right. Make sure that you have the skills that you're claiming to have when, when you go into these interviews. Make sure that when you're going into a company, you are a, an asset to them instead of, uh, you know, or you've been honest about, I need to learn these things. That's, that's really what helps us as, as employers know how to identify and how to help people where they are. Because if they come in saying, hey, I've, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, I'm really good at it, and they've worked at, you know, 17 or 18 different companies um, that, that have given them great positions for six months each, you know, it's, usually that's a warning sign that people yeah. have been a little shallow maybe with, with their own, um, uh, 
you know, self, uh, um, you know, the way that they've looked at it, the way that they viewed their own set. And, um, but I think being just straight up honest and saying, here's where I'm at, here's where I'd like to be in five years or three years, can you help me get there? And what are you willing to pay me while I'm getting there? And I think at that point, that's a very hireable person if they come in and have that language, because I already know what they're going to be expecting of me. They know what I'm expecting of them, and I, I can build a success path for that person to get to where I need them to be in five years and where they want to be. Um, so one of the questions I, I, I had was talking about where, to, where you look for candidates. Now, I'm assuming you, you aren't just you know, throwing your listings on you know, Indeed and, and waiting for them to come to you. Are you actually seeking out good candidates? And if so, where, what unconventional places might you be looking? Where, where, would, where, where are some places people should be looking apart from just saying, well, we only got one candidate. I don't know what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we go to a lot of shows, uh, shows. Um, we're, we're kind of lucky. We we're based in Southern Utah, outside Las Vegas. We have two really good hiring pools. Salt Lake, Salt Lake has actually turned into a pretty large tech hub. Um, there are a lot of people up there. Adobe moved there. You've got the Microsoft office there. You've got uh, Vivint Solar up there. You have a lot of really well-paying and well-established tech companies up there. And so there are a lot of people, and they've been working with a lot of our local colleges to get people into programs to help them identify, you know, what they want to do and to help them become, you know, uh, uh, skilled at that. Um, and then also just the, the people around the edges who just do a really great job with it, but aren't in, involved in school. You know, we have a, re we're lucky because there's a really broad base for hiring where we, where we are. Um, I think that if, if, uh, well, and then, then we have the conventions, we go and try to be active in, in, in going to, you know, small meets or meet and greets, things that are from our local community. Um, but also, uh, you know, we, we use LinkedIn, we use, um, we use referral basis. A lot of our, uh, our good workers that come in, they've usually worked with other people. Um, even if they aren't in tech, we try to, uh, to kind of draw from that. Um, but really, we just try to have a really solid ground game. We try to be really open at the very beginning about what expectations are and how you can grow here if, you, if you'll commit to the process. And then from there, you know, we've, we've, luckily, we've, we've not really run into too many issues where we've had a difficult time finding talent. Okay, so um, jumping to the sort of organizational side of things, um, you know, and, 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 you know, I, I don't know necessarily if you, you hire everyone personally, but like what kind of questions should you be asking candidates or, you know, existing employees to prove their knowledge, uh, you know, rather than just looking at their, you know, their degrees or their certifications or whatever, like what kind of, um, what, what clues do you, do you see in a candidate? Well, so we have a multi, uh, uh, kind of multi varied, um, approach. Uh, what we do is we try to, we try to have as many, um, interview pr in the process as possible. We, you know, one will be a technical proficiency, one will be soft skills, one will be, um, you know, well, they, if they make it through the technical proficiency, uh, then what we try to do is put a, put together um, uh, kind of a, a, a dr we draw from different parts of the company from uh, problems that we've experienced and how we've had to solve them. They're usually, some of them are pretty difficult that have taken us a moment to really get on top of. Other ones are pretty common. And what we try to do is see how they adapt in the moment. Um, and so it's one thing to be able to be at home or to be you know, at your desk here and to run into something and try to figure out, you know, you have time, you have the people around you, try to figure out the best way to do it. But again, watching the way that they solve those problems, how their, what their body language is when they're under pressure, because we work in, a, in an industry where sometimes there's zero pressure and sometimes it's the whole, the whole place is burning down. So we've got to get on top of a leak. We've got to get on top, on top of something really quickly. Um, so watching how they work in that environment has been really important to us. Um, but we try to, we try to stage it out. There's, I forget what the, the CEO of Yahoo, uh, a really bright, uh, woman that I've, I've, you know, looked to quite a bit through my career, but she said, uh, hire slowly, fire quickly. And that's a okay. big goal for us is that we want to maintain a culture of, of curiosity. We want to make sure that we're rewarding people who are just constantly driving um, their own knowledge base and their own interest in, the, in, in what they're doing. We want to get rid of people or cycle through people who are not interested in, in having it as a long-term solution for them or a long-term investment for them. And so for us, we try really hard to go through you know, a multi-staged approach to make sure that we know what the general interest of this person is, where their proficiency is, where, where we could really fit them into the company, and with what team they would, they would gel the most as far as their soft skills and their interpersonal um, you know, interests are. Um, so we try to be really uh, broad about that and getting to know the, the, the candidates before we bring them in. It's obviously difficult because with growth, you have to get them in as fast as you can. And so we just, we, we do the best we can, but you know, every company has a little bit of this. Um, we try to mitigate that as much as we can with the iron process, but it's, it's inevitable.
So sure. So uh, in sort of tying off this this section of the interview, uh, uh, you know, the proverbial, if you have the proverbial magic wand to solve the skills gap, you know, tomorrow, what actions would you take? What is what is the combination of fast track measures and long term solutions that you think would, would solve this? Well, I think, you know, number one would just end cybercrime, obviously. That's a great thing. <laughs> I have access Put to us all out of business. <laughs> Um, but I think that, uh, the biggest thing again, is just becoming adaptable. That one thing that I think people forget about is it's on the other side of this, there are individuals and individual interests. It's not this, you know, large, um, automaton that has, you know, miscellaneous interests. They want to make money. They want to do it by stealing your data. They want to do it by stealing your identity. And so sometimes we get to this point where we, we feel like it's so advanced and so beyond the realm of, of individual thought. We forget that it's individuals on the other side, brilliant individuals, but still individuals nonetheless that are trying to figure out ways to get that data out. And so I think that uh, the way that we solve that is by, again, putting money as, as companies, investing in individuals who are so um, driven by this that it makes it worth their while to come and, and work on the straight side, not on the, not on the, on the kind of the dark side of this, of this whole problem. Um, and I think that as we do that, it's never going to go away. Organized crime has been around as long as people have been around. But I think that uh, understanding and getting ahead of it in the way that we are starting to, you know, when you look at the 1990s and early 2000s, the way we dealt with cybersecurity, you know, the, the last, last year, cybersecurity became a bigger uh, money maker for organized crime than drug trafficking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Crazy. And I think understanding that and saying, okay, well, then we just, we as people need to get, be more prepared. And so, but, you know, better training, better investment in internal pro, uh, practices to make sure that, uh, that we're developing new software, that we're adapting as companies uh, into the next model. You know, one of the questions that you'd written on, uh, on the thing you sent me was, um, what's the future for MDR? Yeah. I would say the, uh, the future for managed detection response is obsolescence. It's going away. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, for eight years, but we can't be behind it anymore. We can't, we can't be behind the curve. We have to be anticipating and trying to, you know, basing statistical models on what's happening and trying to figure out how to forecast what's coming. And, you know, for, for Singo, we've been working for the last couple of years to, to graduate to a managed SIM. And, you know, at the, at the beginning of the year, we'll be launching our SIM, SIM software for all our current clients and then going out and marketing it to additional clients. But really, we have to become more adaptable. We have to use, uh, you know, AI. We have to try and get ahead of, um, if they're using big data, then we need to use it too. We need to be... Uh, okay creating statistical models to get ahead of the threat and we can start to see and forecast a little better about the way that they're dealing with that. How, how does that work? What, how, how would we, as you say, use big data to get ahead of the threat? What is, what does that look like? Well, when we're looking at the way that people come in and, and try to infiltrate, there's, there is a recorded method. every okay. single time. And when we start to look at that and if we can, I mean, it's the whole, the whole way that we discover phishing and spear phishing and things like yeah. that, you have these different data sets that start to pr provide a commonality. Uh, between them. And I think that as, as companies, uh, especially cyber companies, start to look at this specifically, and we've done this internally, you start to look at the ways that your clients are, are, are attempted to be breached every day. And you start to create a statistical model based on the way that they're, they're trying to make those, that entry. And then you can start to see trends. You know, you're still going to have the low-end guys that are just constantly pinging uh, you know, people's IPs endlessly. And then you're going to have the hiring guys that are not just using uh, um, you know, spear phishing, they're, they're getting into your social media, learning your, tri your habits, learning your secretary's name or birthday or everything else. You know, yep. the ability to, they're, they're starting to use, uh, instead of hacking, um, uh, their social hacking instead of cyber hacking. I mean, they're getting information that way. And so I think, again, if we can be smart about it and we can end up basing a lot of the decisions we make off of statistical models instead of just our gut feeling or whatever, you know, is driving us, then I think we're going to have we're going to be able to get ahead of it a lot faster, and I think we are getting smarter as an industry about how to do that, about how to read the data, and about how to get get ahead of it. Okay, so as we wrap up today, uh, what are some cybersecurity issues that you would like to see people more aware of and proactive about? And conversely, are there any sort of cybersecurity uh, you know scares out there that people are spending entirely too much time worrying about? Um, I think that I mean, no, I don't think that anybody's spending too much time worrying about it. I think that. Okay. There are, there are things that are far less probable, but I would say that right. probably the greatest threat is, is the soft stuff, the small stuff. You know, are you, are you playing Wi-Fi, uh, public Wi-Fi on your phone still at a coffee shop? Are you, right. you, know, are you plug, plugging your phone into your computer at work to recharge it? Are you, I mean, there's these tiny things, but I would say probably 
you know, 70 to 80% of all hacks happen from these like minor things that people just forget. It's just housekeeping stuff really. Um, and so I, I would say that if, if there was anything that I was going to leave uh, uh, your listeners with, it's just be smart about the small stuff. Have, have an etiquette as far as how you handle your, your data, how you're, you know, don't email uh, things you know you shouldn't email. Most people, and that's the great thing, most people understand what's wrong. It's just they get a little lazy around the edges. And it's yeah. in moments that you get trapped. I mean, you could live, live an extraordinarily clean, uh, you know, clean way as far as uh, your interaction with the, the cyber world goes. But you make one small mistake one day, and yep. that may be the day they get you. So yeah. I, I would say that. I mean, the big things are always going to be there, but the, the small things are the things that they just, they'll, they'll get in a lot faster. So be careful. Yeah, sweat, with them. sweat the small stuff. So uh, exactly. if, if people want to uh, know more about you, uh, Scott Madsen, or Singo Solutions, where can they go online? Uh, our website is singo.solutions. Uh, all of our products and, and our history are up on that, on that site. I um, mean, our Twitter is at Single Solutions. Um, if you want to know more about me or, or any of the people who work here, just go ahead and LinkedIn where most of our staff's on that. So uh, good way to get a hold of us. But uh, but yeah, or you can just call in through the front line. It's one eight one eight 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 or sorry, one eight three three Single IT. Okay, Scott Madsen, thanks for your time and insights today. Thanks a lot, Chris. Thanks. Uh, and thank you all for listening and watching. If you enjoyed today's video, you can find many more of them on our YouTube page. Just go to YouTube and type in Cyberwork with InfoSec to check out our collection of tutorials, interviews, and past webinars. If you'd rather have us in your ears during your workday, all of our videos are also available as audio podcasts. Just search Cyberwork with InfoSec in your podcast catcher of choice. And to see current promotional offers available to listeners of this podcast, go to infosecinstitute.com slash podcast or click the link in the description. Thanks once again to Scott Madsen, and thank you all again for watching and listening. We'll talk to you next week.